Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. The ninth Sunday after Pentecost falls on August 2nd, 2020. And the texts are from the Old Testament, the complimentary reading, Isaiah 55, 1 through 5, the semi-continuous Old Testament reading from Genesis 32, 22 through 31. The Psalm is 145, verses 8 through 9, and then 14 through 21. The epistle text is Romans 9, 1 through 5, and from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. How did they get to be August already? I should say, we're filming this. here's the big secret. We're filming this in June, so we have no idea what's wrong or what's right with the world in August, but we're going to do our best. But summer is going to fly by, as it always does. Uh, okay, so with Matthew, this the feeding of the 5,000, which uh, is in all four Gospels, of course. I uh, very much appreciated the commentary online, and I want to lift out one verse that, uh, that I felt like was... This is immediately to what I was drawn in this, uh, in this passage. And that is the commentary uh, says, uh, so Jesus' compassion compels him to act. So too should it be with us. While we may feel sympathy for someone, how does often does the emotion result in action? And that I think is my, uh, my hermeneutic for this, uh, this passage this time around. And, uh, and that compassion, of course, uh, is such an interesting verb in Greek of that uh, splagnizomai, you know, feeling it in your uh, gut and uh, your, your intestines of that kind of compassion that literally moves you. Uh, but it, and moves toward action. And so uh, that's where I would spend some time on a sermon, uh, the way in which, uh, the way in which that this, um, uh, this feeling of compassion, it's a verb here. It's not like Jesus was compassionate. It's Jesus felt this compassion that leads him uh, to this act. Uh, and uh, where is it that, 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 also is called for in our own lives. That's the first direction I, first homiletical possibility I would go. And I'm gonna go right behind you and uh, say that's, that's exactly what stood out for me. Um, again, I paid attention to uh, how this starts. Um, now when Jesus had heard this, what is it that he's heard? Um, his circumstances such that his cousin is dead. We, would, we could even suggest his mentor if, if dead, this is a significant moment where Jesus says, you know, I'm just going to try and get away for a bit. And yet, in the midst of that real moment, when he sees the brokenness around him, he is compelled to compassion, to, to use that word. And um, what a challenge for us. Um, and, and, and I'm going to slip in and back with uh, the other descriptions of God here where um, Jesus sees the people, they come to him, and he's gracious, he's merciful, he is compassionate. Um, it's as if Jesus is living between the darkest moment and the dawn of a new movement of God's healing work. And that, that's what I would do with this text. I appreciate that from both of you, the, the, the compassion to action, but the, the setting with John, this is a dangerous time to be a prophet in the land. If John has just been executed, this is a dangerous time for people who have followers and who like to hang out in the wilderness because of John's death. And yet Jesus does this. When I was in the Holy Land, I haven't been able to say that for a while, but one of the things you notice in the, around Galilee, and even if you're going to press out to a wilderness area, if he's across the Jordan or if he's up in the north, if he's Golan Heights, it's not exactly clear where he is. It's hard to stay hidden when you have a lot of these low hills and then valleys and cities are built 
in places, especially some of the cities where the Romans control uh, and have a lot of, you know, kind of a bureaucracy there. They are built on places, Sepphoris, for example, where you can see a lot of the surrounding valleys. 5,000 men plus women and children, let's assume there's 10,000 people there, 12,000 people there coming home. And they're, they're going to be visible, right? And when they come home, depending on which directions they're going, they're going to be seen and they're going to be talked about. And people who collect taxes will notice this increase in travel or whatever. There's, there's something about his action that goes beyond just generosity, but is also taking on risk onto himself and on his movement. That's worth noting uh, as well here, just as it was probably when, when God continues to feed people in the wilderness in the Old Testament, that they are, he, God is sustaining a people there so that they might form a new nation, so that they might form some kind of a new society. And, and there are hints to that in this passage as well. It's a movement, not a moment. It's a beautiful, one of the reasons why I love the synoptic accounts, you know, over that, what's it called, John, is the, the ways in which this is a discipleship moment as well for the 12, that, that they are called into action. And in John, it appears that Jesus is both chef and, and waiter at the same time. In John, the 12 are, are told, you know, you find them some food. They have to distribute the food. They have to pick up the leftovers afterwards. There's a way in which they're participating in all of this that's, uh, that's really significant. I mean, we're going to have walking on water next week. That's also uh, noteworthy that this is not just Jesus saying, watch how compassionate I can be, but he's calling us into a similar kind of, of, of action activity as well. I think that's, that's a really important uh, detail in addition to what you know, Joy and I were emphasizing is that, uh, that, this, that this compassion is, um, it, it can't just be Jesus alone watching, observing Jesus do this, that, that we're, we're invited into this uh, as partners come with, you know, uh, compassion <laughs> and uh, it, it with, and it's, uh, and yeah, and you're right, that detail of, of the disciples, it's not, you know, it's not just, uh, it's, it's not just action in the future, but it's an, it's an immediate participation and immediate action uh, that the disciples are called into, uh, which is, of course, different than uh, the Gospel of John, and I think that's important. The other the other detail I think that is quite striking here is the twice mentioned detail of the fact that it's a deserted place. And, you know, initially it's with, he withdrew. And as you said, Joy withdrew to a deserted place by himself, you know, given the fact that John has just died and hearing about the death of John the Baptist. Um, and, uh, and then he has all of these followers, but it's to a deserted place and, and that wilderness place. And just so all of the, of course, illusions of what desert and wilderness uh, mean, this is where, you know, this is where Jesus, of course, was tempted in, um, by, the, by the devil and then the wilderness and desert spaces um, in the Old Testament, but yet God is present. And so there's this, um, you know, this subterranean theme of the promise of, of God's presence or the promise of God's provision and care uh, in those most, uh, most lonely, deserted, isolated wilderness kinds of spaces that I think could be another uh, homiletical direction. And that it is with what they have. It's what they, what they have with them. You know, they, it, it, we need to see that we have enough in the hands of, of God. You're not There's more than enough, right? There's abundance here in terms of the leftovers uh, as well. And, mm -hmm. and so in two weeks, you'll get the, we will get the, the story of the Canaanite woman who acknowledges there's plenty here to go around in her own uh, um, her own efforts to get Jesus to heal her daughter. Ralph, you were nodding back there. Well, I'm, I don't have much uh, to add to what you guys are saying. I mean, the, the three sort of traditional ways to move out of this story are one like the commentary on the website does to sort of food justice issues and hunger. And there, and there you have to at least talk about Norman Borlaug, the greatest American of the 20th century, a lifelong Lutheran, uh, but uh, who uh, did more to feed the world than anybody in that century. You don't have to, but uh, 
but you can also talk about things like Heifer Project International or Bread for the World, um, organizations uh, uh, that uh, try to solve hunger at, at its source rather than just, um, you know, like Feed My Starving Children, which is also a good organization, but uh, they're not trying to solve uh, the issue so much uh, at its source. Uh, another direction, like you said, is abundance of creation. And uh, and the third direction, because uh, I know that anytime there's bread in a, in a um, passage, Caroline wants to talk about the Lord's Supper. The sacramental root um, is the other traditional way that a lot of preachers move out of this. Isn't that right, Caroline? That is right. Preachers have a tendency to do that. Exactly. So, all right. So uh, uh, the, 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 the complimentary Old Testament reading uh, is the first part of Isaiah 55. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had the last part of Isaiah 55. It's sort of um, odd to get this back uh, in, this, uh, in this role, but um, here's what I love about this. Um, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. You that have no money, come, you know, procure and eat, you know, get wine and milk without money, without price. Um, what I, uh, this is the end of Isaiah, second Isaiah, which runs from 40 through 55. And so you get this big, like, like uh, Romans 8, this is a big um, climactic fireworks. It's the last, it's the finale of um, second Isaiah. And um, for a big part of the Old Testament, when they want to talk about the abundance of God's grace, love, and mercy, uh, the image is the feast. Um, money had not yet been invented. It was just being invented around this time, a little bit later, actually, than this. So, so uh, an image of abundance isn't to have a lot of money. It's to have a lot of food. Um, and uh, that's what God's love is over and over and over again pictured like the feast. Um, and uh, um, the Old Testament says to understand what God's like, at certain times in the year, you have to you have to yourself throw a feast and participate in a feast and make sure everyone's invited and everybody has a place at the table. And, and so our culture does that at different times. Um, but um, you know, uh, summer is one of those times uh, that that we do this. Now, now July Fourth will have passed by the time this text comes up. But the idea of um, a feast and experiencing God's love in that kind of community, I think, is a wonderful. Uh, direction to go. I really appreciate that link, uh, Ralph. And um, you're saying that raises raises a, a a bit of a question for me. But I'm gonna I'm gonna lead with this thought that the connection first brought up for me, and that is um, this is raising the morale of a longing community. Um, and 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 I, I'm lingering on the community, a communal idea here, much like we've seen uh, just uh, in the Matthew pa passage. But here, it's not in David, but in the people of David. The, the commentary points to that. And and to make a modern par parallel, it's not in a Martin Luther King, but the beloved community that he envisioned. It's not in the individual. It, it, it truly is in the community around uh, 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 that, that, to use the word that um, um, uh, Caroline brought us in with this on, uh, that is compelled uh, to act and to, to set that table um, and to show the abundance of God. And now I just talked myself out of the question. I want to know what the question was. So do I. I should have led with the question. I can't remember. Oh, that's good. I like Joy, that. Joy, Joy would really like to know the question, too. I, I do that all the time. Uh, yeah, Steve Reed's commentary on the website uh, is great. Um, there, this is uh, the, um, the mention of David is, is simply interesting from a lexical uh, or a syntactical perspective because um, it's not clear whether it's I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. The word for is not there. It's actually simply the, um, it's the word chesed in the plural construct of David, the, the sure love of David. And, and we're not sure whether, this is a, this is a classic uh, exercise I give advanced Hebrew students, but uh, it's the only mention of David in second Isaiah. And moving on, because that's exciting. Let's get back to Jacob. 
Matt. And I have to say that this is not my favorite um, Jacob passage, but it, for a lot of people it is. They love this story the most out of all the Jacob stories. This might be my favorite biblical passage. Say more. It's, it's great stuff. This is what a relationship with God looks like, I think. Uh, the idea of, of wrestling and contending and then um, being named, being told who you are, saying, I won't let you go until I get a blessing. This is a great example for what I think a life of faith looks like. And it's, I think it's important for Christians to know this story well. This is where Israel gets its name. And that matters for Christian faith as much as it matters for Jewish faith in different ways, but it still, it still matters. And then Jacob walking away with a hip, that, uh, with a limp because of his hip and a way in which God remains powerful here, but God, God is always engaged in the back and forth of interaction with humanity. God doesn't, you know, okay, so here's, I'm going to lose my Calvin card for this, you know. I, God might exist or be capable of existing separate from humanity, but we have no way of even approaching or comprehending that. And why would God even want to do that if God is like what we read about in Scripture, right? That our encounters with God are always shaped by a struggle, not just a struggle of our own existence, but a struggle to know God and a struggle to know God's blessing. And this is what's animated Jacob's whole life. He just, he just wants to be blessed by God. Uh, and damn it, he finally does it. And he, he wins the blessing, not because God rolls over and plays dead, but because Jacob doesn't quit all night long. And I just, there's something beautiful about that. There's something that dignifies what it means to be human and also shows the way in which we affect God. We, we are caught up in the life of God in our own ways as well. Which, of course, then, you know, we have an incarnation for those of us who are Christian. And that also gets pretty exciting, too, to talk about some of these same things, right? Just the bodily interaction with, with God, to share space with God. I, uh, yeah, I, at this time, I, you know, it's just one of those, one of those details that, that you, that you know and you remember, but you, you kind of uh, focus on other things. But this time around, I just, I was just struck by the, uh, the the significance of the location uh in that that the you know the previous encounter that uh that jesus had with god or jesus jacob had with god alone you know he's alone and uh and and he's sleeping on a rock and then names the names the place where he is bethel because of that experience of god and here now it's Penuel uh, naming, naming, renaming, or naming a place because of God's, God's what God does and who God is, and uh, and and of course both times he's alone, which I think is interesting, but I, I I'm really struck by that that naming of I mean we 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 talk a lot about the renaming of of Jacob, but this this naming of place. Uh, that gives witness to God's activity and and the characteristics of God, the the nature of God, uh, and I um, I'm not I haven't worked that thought out uh, completely, but it would it would I don't know it would be something I would think about more as a preacher and it's just inviting people, particularly when our sense of place or the sense of meeting God or where we meet God or where we think we know where God is has been so upended uh, in the last months. And so our, our confidence in God's uh, presence in certain places is, uh, I think, a little bit um, uh, ruffled. <laughs> and so how is it that we invite uh, imagination around these places, these new places that, uh, that, that, uh, that we might want to name uh, where, where we've had an experience with God uh, that we want to remember. That's helpful. Uh, I want to throw in a couple other little details. Um, one is, um, you know, uh, 
does this start off, I can't remember, does it start off that same night? Yeah, the same night. So what night? Uh, he is returning after his long sojourn with Laban with all his stuff now. He's coming back a wealthy man. And Esau comes out to meet him, and he thinks Esau is going to kill him. And he splits his forces. Uh, in, he splits all his stuff in half, and then he's alone. Again, that, that detail. He's still... He's still the guy who's contending, right? So that God says, in the NRSV, it says, you have struggled with God and with men um, and have overcome, or at least, uh, sorry, that's not the NRSV. That's, that's the, uh, what, what we have on our website. The NRSV is you have striven with God and humans and have prevailed, um, which is where you get the name Yisra. And the word for strive uh, is Sarah the same as the name of Sarah. So there is this great allusion back to um, Jacob's grandmother, which I think is wonderful. And that this is, it's not just Jacob, it's Sarah strove with God. So you can kind of tie in the longer Genesis narrative there. And what does it look like to strive with God? There you, got, there you have the Psalms. Um, to strive with God and demand um, redemption and blessing and healing. Um, the psalm that goes with this, uh, if people follow the semi-continuous, it's not on our website, but it's Psalm 17, which starts off, here are just cause, and the person's demanding to God, this is not an irrational ask. I am not asking for something that's out of order. It's, it's, it's a fair ask. And, and then it ends, uh, uh, with the reference to the face, as for me, I shall behold your face, which is, of course, a, a lovely reference back to Penuel. So those three details are fun for me. I appreciate that tying in as well. Um, um, and it circles around also for me going back to Jacob in that uh, he's already a, a bit different um, at, at this point where he was alone before. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, Matt, I think it was you that brought up that um, he had received the blessing. One of us said that he had received the blessing and he was running off. And, and now that contending, um, as you point out, uh, Ralph, is at the point where he is we read it as protecting himself, but he's also protecting his family. Uh, he sent them off in, in two different ways because he thinks that, that Esau is coming after him. And so he's doing this protecting act um, that is for others as well as for himself, uh, if you can read it that way. And he stands his ground. And, and I use that word because of all of the social uh, baggage it carries these days. He stands his ground and he's blessed. Um, and, and that was the reference I made um, uh, back when we were talking about Matthew, that th here was that transforming mo moment between dark and dawn, and that the dawn comes uh, at the presence of God. Uh, the dawn comes, uh, like you just tied in, Ralph, at the graciousness and the mercy of God. And I'm gonna go back to where we, we started, where we talk about God is good. And then we say we should be good. We, we, we say God is compassion, compassionate to all, and that we should be compassionate to all. Well, the psalmist begins here that God is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and so it seems to me, if we're going to use those two other moves, that it's time for us to say that we should be merciful, that we should be slow to anger, and that we should be abounding with steadfast love. Not, not saying that to the person who's, who, who's not sharing the same space with us, but to the person who seeks common ground with us. It's real easy for us to say, you know, I'm going to be nice to the person who, who is right there with me. You, uh, that's uh, not the person that is seeking it. And how do we find that? How do we find the ability in this, this chaotic moment uh, by the power of God to, to seek to be merciful in that moment? 
I'm sorry, Ralph, I just wanted to finish that. No, I, I think it's brilliant. And then you have to tell the rest of Jacob and Esau's story. The, the, uh, the, the semi-continuous skips their reunion. It goes ahead to Genesis 37. Um, and Esau then is the one that does that. Yes. Esau in the story is the one who um, meets, right, uh, runs, to, embraces him. I mean, he's, uh, and says, you know, um, he says these words of welcome and, uh, and uh, the watch between. Yeah. He's the one who's gracious and forgiving. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but we have to move on. Um, uh, the, the one thing I want to say about the Psalm, but I'd be interested to hear what others have to say is, is that um, it's Psalm 145 is uh, an acrostic Psalm. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So it doesn't hold together because it's going back you know, through the letters of the alphabet, it gets, it's, um, it's not following a form of prayer. It's sort of like, it's just, um, it gets a little random, but in the midst, you have this great prayer that uh, can be used ecumenically as a table blessing that the eyes of all look to you when you give them their food in due season, you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. And you can see how that obviously is a good match for the, um, for the gospel reading, um, but it's it, it's a line about um, you know God's ongoing provision and abundance, and you could use it liturgically, right, Caroline? You sure could. I was going to say that. Uh, Romans nine. Whoops, Romans nine. Uh, so nine one through five, and. Uh, and for uh, the preacher out there who, the preachers out there who have been working through Romans, this is a, a significant uh, portion in the book, uh, in the letter. And we have three, uh, three continuous readings in Romans 9, 10, and 11 from, uh, from each of those chapters respectively. And uh, we have a commentary by uh, none other than the Reverend Dr. Matt Skinner. Uh, so thank and you for that. Matt. It is remarkable because I do think it's the first um, first commentary that we've ever had that uses the word damn in the very first sentence. Damn. But not as an explanation, <laughs> but as a verb. Yeah, it's a nice verb. Nice commentary, Matt. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but it, this, you know, I think this uh, this passage, it's, it's one of, the, it, looking at these next three, you know, these next three readings, and you, you talk a lot about this uh, in your commentary, Matt, of, of, and in particularly, I think, framed it very helpfully, you know, the question driving this section of Romans is, what's God doing? It's not what's wrong with these unbelievers. And, uh, and the way in which a preacher can engage these next three weeks around these passages, particularly with regard to pervasive and prevalent anti-Semitism uh, and, uh, and how, to, how to drop into these, uh, into these, uh, pass the, these verses where Paul is navigating, you know, what, what does this, who is God in the midst of this? I, I think that reframing of the question becomes really sort of the theological, uh, the theological shift that needs to happen when we, when we, when we engage um, people in discussion uh, around our uh, either are there blatant or uh, not blatant anti-Semitism, and it is so our our, our tendencies uh, in our preaching <laughs> are are consistently uh, um, anti-semitic and i don't know if i i don't know if our i don't know if preachers realize how much their their preaching sounds that way and so and and we make these claims about you know the jewish people as if god has as what are we saying about god uh, when uh, when we make these claims, these fundamental judgments about believers and in, in, you know uh, particularly Jewish believers, so I I, I don't know. That's all. All, the, all that is to say is it's really important and become depending on what your context is, it becomes a way to engage this head on uh, in your in your context. 